My name is Jeff Rosenthal, and I am a recent graduate of Emory University School of Medicine, and I will be presenting a microlearning curriculum series with the RSNA case collection on intracranial sarcoidosis. Here we have a non-contrast CT of the head, which are often negative in patients with intracranial sarcoidosis, but you may see parenchymal edema as shown here, or nonspecific hyperdensities. MRI findings of intracranial sarcoidosis include nonspecific white matter edema demonstrated on the left as hyperintense signal on T2 flare sequences. On the right, post-contrast sequence, we can see enhancement primarily involving the parenchyma, but there may also be cortex and leptomeningeal enhancement. We'll focus a bit more on leptomeningeal involvement where you may see diffuse or nodular thickening and enhancement. Often this involves the perivascular and or basal cisterns. There is also a predilection for the basal meninges. Other MRI findings in patients with intracranial sarcoidosis are enhancing mass lesions, which appear hypointense on T2 sequences with surrounding edema. Here we have a post-contrast MRI showing abnormal enlargement and enhancement of the optic nerve, which is the most commonly involved cranial nerve in patients with intracranial sarcoidosis. However, the most common symptomatic cranial nerve is the facial nerve. There may also be involvement of the hypothalamus and pituitary gland, demonstrated as thickening and enhancement of the infundibular stalk or optic chiasm. It is uncommon but possible to see dural masses, which appear isointense on T1 sequences and variably hypointense on T2 sequences. Other MRI findings in patients with intracranial sarcoidosis include lacunar infarcts, vasculitis, hydrocephalus, and subcortical vasogenic edema. Moving on to the discussion, sarcoidosis is an idiopathic systemic disease caused by the formation of non-caseating granulomas. The lungs and lymph nodes are most often affected. While less common, it is important to consider central nervous system involvement. Here we can see the prevalence of subclinical, symptomatic, and isolated CNS involvement. CNS symptoms are often the presenting symptoms in these patients and depend on the site of involvement. The most common symptoms are facial nerve paralysis, vision loss, and headache. Herod Fort syndrome is a combination of facial nerve palsy, fever, parotid gland enlargement, and uveitis. Making the diagnosis of intracranial sarcoidosis involves clinical signs and imaging findings and often relies on identifying sarcoidosis in other organ systems. As we can see here, abnormal subcarinal lymph nodes on chest imaging. Tissue biopsy is generally not feasible for central nervous system involvement, and other sites are preferred, such as lymph nodes or chest nodules. However, you may have abnormal CSF results, including elevated cell counts or protein and oligoclonal bands. The treatment of central nervous system sarcoidosis, as well as sarcoidosis in general, includes high dose corticosteroids, followed by a lower dose maintenance period. Uh, second line treatment may include methotrexate. There is a low correlation between symptom resolution and imaging findings in CNS sarcoidosis. The differential diagnosis depends on the pattern of involvement. For pachymeningeal involvement, it is important to consider meningioma and metastases. For leptomeningeal involvement, one must think about meningitis and metastases. On the left, we can see an example of leptomeningeal carcinomatosis in a patient with a history of breast cancer. And lastly, for parenchymal involvement, the differential diagnosis includes demyelination, as shown on the right in the example of multiple sclerosis, in addition to neoplasm, metastases, and encephalitis. In conclusion, intracranial sarcoidosis is uncommon, but may lead to focal neurologic symptoms. Imaging findings include thickening or enhancement of the leptomeninges. You can have parenchymal mass lesions, which are either enhancing masses and nodules or periventricular white matter lesions. However, imaging findings may be nonspecific, and it is important to consider a wide differential diagnosis based on the pattern of involvement. Here are some references for anyone interested, and thank you for listening to this microlearning curriculum series presentation.